Happy New Year and welcome to Missouri 2021 Presents. I'm Beth Pike, your host for this series on Zoom, where we are live the first Tuesdays at 11 each month, leading up to Missouri's Statehood Day in August. And we are so excited that the bicentennial year has finally arrived after many years of preparation. We have a most interesting program this hour that takes us back 200 years. Well, maybe a few years longer than that, actually, as Missouri struggled for its statehood. And joining us to delve into this important topic are panelists and scholars on the subject of Missouri statehood, Dr. William S. Belkel, who we call Steve and who is the executive director of the Missouri Humanities Council. We also have Professor Jeff Paisley, professor of history and the associate director of the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy at the University of Missouri. Both Jeff and Steve each have books coming out this spring on the very topic of Missouri statehood. So we'll learn more about their books, a documentary in progress, and the collaboration of a must-see traveling and digital exhibit titled Struggle for Statehood, which was developed by the Missouri Humanities Council in consultation with the Kinder Institute and is supported by the Bicentennial Alliance. And among the members of the project team who put this well done exhibit together is Claire Brunsrager and she joins us too. Claire is a development manager for the Missouri Humanities Council. And then later in the program, we're going to hear from Michael Sweeney, the Bicentennial Coordinator for Missouri 2021 with an update on what is happening as uh, Missouri launches our Bicentennial year. But before we hear from our panelists, we do have a few reminders for all of you to, uh, joining us this hour. Uh, in about 40 minutes, we're going to be opening up to a discussion for your questions. And at any time during the hour, you can type your question by clicking on the Q&A button, which is on the bottom of your screen. And at the end, we will take questions in the order it's received. We won't see or hear you on camera, but we will be able to read and try to respond to your questions. And at the end of our program, we have several prize drawings for those who registered for the se session. So we're going to give some cool bicentennial swag away and we'll have a special drawing for those of you who stay to the end and can answer a fun pop quiz question on Missouri statehood. So what is the Missouri Compromise? I know we have a very educated audience joining us and you have a pretty good idea of what that means, but to start things off, let's hear from Steve Belko with a synopsis, if you will, on what it is we're talking about when we refer to the Missouri crises that led to the Missouri Compromise, allowing Missouri to become the 24th state to join the union. Steve. Well, uh, I guess you should go see our great traveling exhibit, which is also digital, uh, to get the whole story of the three years. We started in 1818 with the first petitions from the territory of Missouri requesting statehood from Congress. We take it all the way up to uh, 1821, August 10th, when the issue apparently finally is resolved. And as a native of Missouri, and I will like to say that, yes, it is a, a major crisis, but really I think 1820 should be our bicentennial year, uh, especially since we have an entire government operating for a first session, uh, governor, lieutenant governor elected and operating. Um, it is a national crisis. Uh, it might be a little bit different in Missouri uh, as it would be in Congress, but it is, it, it's a major crisis. Uh, might not have happened if Missouri was not the very first state to come completely west of the Mississippi River out of the Louisiana Purchase Territory and not part of the original territory uh, seized from Britain, if you will, and the Treaty of Paris uh, ending the American Revolution. That's a, it's a major crisis at that point. Um, hence, Indiana comes in in 1819 and no one's ever questioning that while Missouri is going through major debate, but um, it is a, it's, it's a comprehensive issue and it goes well beyond slavery and the admission of states. My book just deals with the constitutional crisis of it. Um, there's much more to it. Our exhibit may not cover all of that, it just can't. Um, but um, Claire is here to tell us a little bit more about it. But it just deals with the struggle for statehood, the uh, years from 1818 um, through August of 1821. We try to touch upon the, not only the topical but the chronological features uh, of that great debate. Uh, not only from Missouri's perspective, uh, but from the national perspective, free slave states. Uh, it was a natural partnership with the Kinder Institute. Um, I went to them directly. I was not, I was actually in another state before I returned back to my home in Missouri. And that state also had a, a major bicentennial and they ignored it. And I had another colleague from another state and they simply really didn't do anything. And I thought, oh, 
Well, I will say that they are states are not as exciting as ours, uh, but nobody uh, ever entered the union with greater fanfare. And I just use that term as loosely as possible than, than Missouri. I would say Texas is second and it is so distant, we're not gonna even mention it. Um, but uh, it is a serious issue and it could change the course of American history. And it does if you look back on it. So um, we prefer Missouri crisis, I think over Missouri compromise or compromises because there were multiple ones. So uh, it was a crisis, never went away. Great. Well, thanks Steve for that summary. And we're gonna explore it a little further in a few minutes with both you and Jeff. Um, but first, I'd like to hand it over to Claire, who is going to tell us more about how the Missouri Humanities Council and the Kinder Institute approach the story of Missouri crises in statehood by creating a very unique display that's traveled throughout the state, it's also online in your digital form, uh, highlighting the human stories surrounding statehood. Claire, thanks for being here. So as uh Steve said, and as Beth said, my name's Claire and I'm with the Missouri Humanities Council. And I was the coordinator for the exhibit. So the go-between between the content developers, Steve and Jeff, the graphic designer for the exhibit and the exhibit manufacturer. And I'm just taking a few minutes this morning to talk to you guys about how we developed the exhibit, which was six freestanding displays, each with two uh, panel sides. So 12 panels altogether. And here is a list of all the panel topics, which I won't really go into right now because Jeff and Steve can speak more on that. But I wanted to talk about a little bit about how we designed the exhibit. So every panel has multiple images, but it has one main background image, uh, which is either a painting, a print, a drawing, or similar kind of artwork that speaks to the panel topic. Uh, but as Steve said, this exhibit focuses on 1819 to 1821, which makes it difficult to find a large number of images that that are contemporary to the time or the event. So we use a lot of images that were maybe from decades later, but were still really good images to use because they still spoke to the topic or the story of the panel. Um, and so I just put three examples up here. And the first one on your left is an illustration of Henry Clay in the Senate from 1850 when the Missouri Compromise was actually overturned. But we still thought it was a great image to use for the Crisis and Compromise panel because it has Henry Clay and it has him in a heated debate in the Senate. And it really spoke to what the, what the political uh, feeling was at the time. And I have two other images on there. Um, one's a lunette from the Capitol from 1920, but um, it's, be, it's, from, it's supposed to depict 1821, the Missouri State Legislator. Um, I also wanted to talk about how we approach the topics of this exhibit. The Missouri crisis in statehood can be really difficult topic to cover because it deals with um, some difficult subjects like the atrocity of slavery and the um, displacement of indigenous communities from the area. And we wanted to make sure that we told this history in a way that really humanized the people who were affected by it. So we decided to highlight the lives of, of specific men and women who were in the region at the time and whose stories really, really sh show how these events affected different groups of people. And so we highlighted multiple historical figures, but I wanted to talk about just a couple. Um, we have Sacred Son on the left, who was also known as Mahongo, who was a woman born in Osage Village in 1809. But when she was 18, she was part of a group of Osage who were brought to France to be showcased, but were ultimately abandoned in the country and she was forced to survive on her own for two years. She made it back to St. Louis in about 1830 and she went, she tried to travel to rejoin her tribe in the area. But by the time she got there, they had already been forced out by political leaders in Missouri who were trying to open up land to induce more white settlers to the area. So that speaks about how statehood and the, and the crisis affected the indigenous communities, communities here. Um, we also looked at William Wells Brown, who was a former Missouri slave who escaped slavery and became a, a, an abolitionist writer and speaker. He tried escaping multiple times, but eventually was able to escape to freedom while working on a steamboat dock in Cincinnati. He was hired later by um, Eliza P. Lovejoy, who ran an anti-slavery newspaper in the area. Um, and Wells, William Wells Brown is a really important person to look at because there's a myth in that Missouri's small scale slave holdings were more benevolent than large scale plantations that were typical in the South but accounts like William Wells Brown and other enslaved Missourians dispute this. And in, and in William Wells Brown's published work, he depict, he talks about how there was frequent use of the whips and a lot of other abuse by the owners on the plantations. Um, and we also looked at Joseph Charles. And 
white Missourians in the area uh, at the time were overwhelmingly pro-slavery, but there was still a small um, community of, of people who wished to see slavery restricted in the area. And Joseph Charles was one of the loudest voices of that group. And he's great to look at because he ran a paper called the Missouri Gazette. And in this paper, he took really bold stances that challenged the status quo of the people at the time and, and printed criticisms of territorial leaders like Thomas Hart Benton, which people weren't normally brave enough to go against him. Um, so he's a really good person to look at. Um, and I also wanted to take a quick moment to talk about how um, a really cool find we made during the research for this exhibit. Uh, in the Missouri Territory, uh, enslaved people fought to gain freedom in many ways, like Williams Wells Brown, they escaped, but some used the courts because there was an, uh, a 1769 Spanish law that ended enslavement of American Indians in the Missouri Territory. And so that law carried over when the territory came under American control. And so therefore, if an enslaved person could prove Native American ancestry, they could possibly get, be freed. Um, and there was a woman named Marie John Sipian who was an African slave with Natchez Indian um, ancestry. And she was enslaved by the Shoto family. But in 1805, 1805 she filed suit um, for her freedom on the basis of her Native American ancestry. Uh, but she was denied it in the St. Louis Circuit Court. But 30 years later, her daughter Marguerite renewed her claim um, suing for freedom against her owner, Pierre Chodeau. And Marguerite initially lost her suit, but she was eventually able to win emancipation when her case went to the Supreme Court in 1836. And the St. Louis Circuit Court Historical Records Project has been working to digitize freedom suits filed in St. Louis. And Marie and Marguerite are included in this. And during the development of the exhibit, uh, a Mizzou student who was doing research for the exhibit in a class that Mizzou had in partnership with us, uh, found a doodle or a drawing on the back of one of these, of one of Marguerite's, uh, or sorry, Marie's um, hearings, uh, court papers that was drawn during a hearing and is believed to be of August Shoto. And so I put up a, a portrait of August Shoto next to it so people can kind of compare and look at it. And it's just really, a really, really cool thing to find. It, it really, it really connects you to um, Marie and Marguerite and really puts you, gives you more feeling about what their lives are like. It's just, it's a very human, human thing to have a doodle on something so, so serious. Um, and so here are just a couple images of the exhibit standing. Like I said, um, it's six standing panels displays with, with 12 panels all together. And this just kind of shows three of them, but the picture on the left is at Washington Public Library, the first host site. Um, the picture on the top right is in the Capitol Rotunda where it was um, in January, 2019. And then finally, I wanted to just share the um, exhibit schedule for the rest of the year. Uh, this is where it will be pending any, any changes and, and any issues with the continued pandemic. Uh, we, we did have a few host sites cancel this past year um, if we could not host it safely, but we are hoping to hopefully reschedule them in 2022. But you can see the exhibit in its full if you want. Um, and it's virtual format, uh, which is also on this uh, link that I put below. And you can also relook at the schedule um, from there to see if it's gonna be in your area. And that's all I got. Great. Thanks, Claire. You know, I've yet to see the exhibit in person myself, but I've gone online to your digital exhibit and it is so well done, um, but I am gonna see it this year. <laughs> I'm making a point for that. But I did learn a great deal of new information and I've been immersing myself uh, really the past several months in our state's history, preparing for the bicentennial year. and. You know, it's really exciting to keep learning and discovering new things, which you have about our state. And uh, anyway, I'm also looking very forward to several books by our panelists that will be out this spring um, related to the Bicentennial and being published by University Press. Um, so we've got two books coming out, Contesting the Constitution, Congress Debates, the Missouri Crises, 1819 to 1821, edited by Stephen Belko and A Fire Bell in the Past, the Missouri Crises at 200, Volume 1. Western Slavery, National Impasse, edited by Jeffrey Paisley and John Hammond. And both Jeff and Steve will tell us more about their books that give us different lenses and how we look back at the Missouri Compromise and our important and painful role in our nation's history. Uh, Jeff Paisley, welcome to the program and congratulations on your upcoming book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, Paisley, by the way. That's all right. Well, so I guess what should I what should what should I do what should I do here first? I mean, I think the first thing to talk about is that this all goes well. I think the exhibit probably came first, uh, but right around the time we were planning the exhibit, uh, there was also a uh, uh, a conference that that we had uh, in 
February February uh, February 2019, which was the, the actually the bicentennial of the the big one of the beginnings of the Missouri crisis, which which is where when the the point when uh, Congress, much to Missourian surprise, uh, voted or at least the House representatives voted to to ban slavery from Missouri and started the whole thing with the so-called uh, Talmadge Amendment after Representative James Talmadge of New York. Uh, let me get the, this was something that uh, we actually just kind of put out some, put out a, uh, put out a call for and got just rather quickly got like two days worth of, two days worth of scholars from uh, all over the country and actually uh, quite a few from other parts of the world uh, who showed up actually on the on the snowiest day that that winter uh, like several of the panelists got trapped here so it was it was actually though a sign that there was a lot more interest in this than I necessarily would have even thought uh, and I, mean, I guess one of the things that people in Missouri don't realize and one of the things that I wanted to be involved in this for is that you know it's our state bicentennial, but it's also this actually major, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of nationally in some ways a significant event in American history. In some ways, a significant event in world history to a degree that we're not really aware. Uh, and I suppose people are generally aware that this has something to do uh, with the Civil War. Uh, when I ask people about this, they can generally say, well, isn't this where uh, Maine had to come in or something as part of the Missouri Compromise? They might be able to say that, but, but it's quite a bit more than that. And I guess my feeling as this bicentennial was coming up, uh, being partly in being in, in charge of the history side of this institute on campus was that, uh, well, maybe Missouri needed to do, a, should do a, actually do a good job this time. Uh, in dealing with its own history, because that's not really the, especially this part. Uh, the fact that uh, the fact that the that that when you know that that Missouri coming into the union set off uh, one of the biggest debate. You know, was as Steve said, it was the undoubtedly uh, the biggest debate. Uh, it was the biggest controversy over the coming of a state of any the, of any that you can think of. Uh, uh, Texas actually be the only, Steve said, Texas uh, is about the only one you can think of that would be a toss, that would even be a, be a contest. Um, but the thing that makes it significant, the thing that makes it significant, uh, unfortunately, is the thing that we'd probably least like to talk about. Uh, and in fact, that a lot of times in Missouri history, and even as part of this bicentennial, has been something that we tend uh, to kind of treat as a, a, a sort of a more of a shameful part that we'd rather not mention, uh, which is the fact not only that it's about slavery, but that you know the Missouri side of this was uh, the kind of eager expansion of slavery. Uh, that's our side of it, and the other side was well, actually maybe not. Uh, uh, that's something that seemed to me that that Missouri should try to kind of uh, to, to 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 grab that uh, to try to actually kind of confront that and make that part of this commemoration uh, uh, in a way that I didn't see that it necessarily had had been had, was 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 going to get done uh, otherwise. So so that's what because so that so that's what I was trying to do with the with the with the with the. Uh, ex my, to my, with my part of the exhibit and with this conference and then with the book, because one of the things that we found when we, we just kind of put out a, a, a call to scholars to say, what, you know, what do you want to talk about with the Missouri crisis? And what we found was what they wanted to talk about uh, was, was uh, the, this, in this as a moment in the expansion of slavery, as, as a part, as a moment, uh, as, as a moment when the anti-slavery movement in the United, in the United States actually got to the early anti-slavery movement actually got to confront or in some cases kind of find out that slavery uh, was expanding uh, and then to actually sort of confront all the issues that surrounded that. And what we discovered doing, hearing all the papers and doing all the research for it was that Missouri's not just the, the spark that kind of sets, it's, it's not just the, 
the sort of the beginning of the Civil War debates that it's really what crystallizes it, I guess you would say, uh, that all of the sort of major issues of the Civil War, all, especially the political issues leading the Civil War, uh, and of kind of Northern versus Southern cultural identity, it all sort of first develops in this controversy. And if you read through the congressional debates and the newspaper debates and the pamphlets, the, the things that went on for like three years, you realize there was very little said, there's very little ever said that wasn't said uh, over Missouri in those three, in those, in those three years. Uh, sometimes by Missourians themselves. You know, you see some uh, some of the first articulation, the first, the real defenses of slavery, for instance, come out of this. Uh, something that had wasn't wasn't used didn't wasn't usually heard uh, before this. So so it's a hugely it's hugely important uh, in that sense. Uh, my contribution, the contribution that I made to it was to more talk about the origin, was a, a essay talking more about the sort of origins of all this and where it all, where it all comes about. And uh, I guess, which, I mean, obviously Missouri is the center, center of all of our lives, but we don't kind of realize just how many things uh, sort of came together with this. Uh, and because it's not just that Missouri started all this, these that all this stuff first crystallized over Missouri is that Missouri formed this kind of bottleneck uh, for westward expansion, you might say, uh, in a place where the westward expansion and slavery kind of crossed up with each other uh, that then became a problem kind of throughout the rest of the middle of the 19th century. Like if you keep going back to problems to, to, to uh, times when westward expansion set off set off uh, issues over slavery is Missouri is where you have to come back to. So what Missouri statehood, what Missouri state app, app, statehood application in 1818, 1819 does is it sets off this unexpected debate where the North and South really saw each other for the first time and realized they had a serious disagreement about the future of the country and were essentially competing, competing for the future uh, in the West. Uh, a future that would be dominated by freedom versus slavery, at least as, as some saw it, uh, and everything that went with, went with those two, I, two, two ideas, including uh, a, a, a labor force that was primarily white versus primarily black, the possibility of full and equal black citizenship that is still struggled over today. All of those things had, were suddenly, suddenly crystallized by this, by this application. And so, one of the things that struck me in reading about it is that, is that when the February 19, 1819, when this, when suddenly uh, Congress, the House of Representatives, votes against slavery in Missouri, it's it's as though it's something that you could predict, you might have been able to predict looking back, but it wasn't as something anyone predicted at the time. Missourians in particular were to totally outraged that anyone would would question uh, what they were doing. Uh, people had moved out to this area. Moved out uh, with their with their enslaved workers, were planning to uh, planning to bring more, and to have uh, uh, a bunch of congressmen from 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 New York and Massachusetts and Vermont, uh, and New Hampshire in uh, Pennsylvania, tell them that okay, no, you're not doing that. Uh, brought the kind of response that you know brought the sort of uh, truculent response that 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 you might imagine it did. That, that you might imagine that it would. And one of the things that uh, between Missouri and between people in the Northeast, there seemed to be some kind of, there were some, some differences that emerged in the country that people didn't necessarily think about uh, at the time until it was all placed in front of them. So this first slide basically shows that since the revolution, one thing that happened, you know, slavery existed everywhere uh, up, until, uh, up until the American Revolution. After the American Revolution, for reasons we don't have to go in, get into, Declaration of Independence being one, and the actions of enslaved people themselves, the other, pressure from the British being another, uh, is that slavery was, was phased out in the places where it wasn't as economically important. And what this, the map shows is the year that slavery was either abolished or that a gradual emancipation law was passed. And as you can see, it kind of goes, New England, it's largely abolished by constitution uh, or by court case in these middle states. 
it's it, their gradual emancipation laws that are passed. And it's in fact, it, what happens to Missouri is, is that especially it's congressmen from New York and Pennsylvania who then essentially tried to impose on Missouri uh, a gradual emancipation system, much like what they had reached, pa had passed themselves uh, in, in uh, about uh, 20 years before that. And then in terms of the West, there's the old Northwest, uh, which was, this is uh, Jefferson's Northwest Ordinance and slavery had been uh, prohibited there by that ordinance. So it had kind of always been planned that slavery was not gonna be part of at least that Northern part of the West. Now, the reality is that wasn't necessarily followed very well, uh, but it was the case, but it was at least in people's minds that, uh, the, plan, that the plan was that there was not gonna be uh, slavery in the, in the West. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily the way, but then there's other things happening alongside of that that create this, this contradiction that Missouri then appears like that's sort of the, the head of. Um, one thing to know about Steve, so I think may talk about the Louisiana Purchase, so I won't, so won't dwell on this. Obviously this comes in 1803. I guess one thing that I would uh, point out about the Louisiana Purchase that people don't necessarily realize is that if you check the, the population densities here, you can see that a lot of the purpose of the Louisiana Purchase from, from Jefferson's perspective, and this is something Missouri's are always, uh, Missouri's are always disappointed to hear this, that really what they were thinking of was the Louisiana Purchase would be a way to uh, more, more heavily settle the Eastern states. Uh, in the sense that uh, there'd be, this is where the idea of Indian removal or exchanging lands on the west of Mississippi for lands, lands east of Mississippi for lands west of Mississippi comes about is they have the, the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, now this is a place to, to start shifting, to force the, start forcing the Eastern Indian populations to move and then fill in places like Kentucky and Tennessee. And then of course, make these new, make these new states. But, uh, and the other thing the Louisiana Purchase does, of course, is brings in the actual state of Louisiana, uh, which, of course, where slavery had long existed. So, and that's part of a kind of counter trend, uh, which is that it's not just people from the Northeast who are moving uh, into this, so into what they were thinking of as a free area. This is this map. I love this is my, my students, and this is like my favorite map I show. Uh, which is this shows the the path, the sort of the what I call the layer cake uh, uh, for, form of of of, uh, of migration, where people kind of migrate west, uh, but kind of in their same latitudes. Uh, of course, what this means is is you've got uh, there's also there's not only willing migration, there's also forced migration going on west in the slave areas in the areas where slavery exists, and it means that this West exists, there's at least two forms of the West that exist. Uh, the one uh, that's, that, that, that in the Northeast they think of as the, fut as the future, uh, you know, as being filled with free laborers and family farmers and, and then eventually railroads and all kinds of things uh, versus the plantation South that's expanding right along with it. Uh, especially once you get the Louisiana Purchase and you've got, uh, uh, you've got this already well-established and well-populated in this area where slavery is uh, down on the Gulf Coast, um, and then this is then a me the this is then shows some of the results of this between 1719 and 1820. Uh, that is to say, between the beginning, you know, between the Constitution, of the first census on the left, and then right when Missouri is trying to become a state, and what you can see is that even though. Uh, slavery of some, a lot of people in the Northeast think of slavery as part of the past. Slavery is something that's been rejected. Uh, is what you can see is what's, what's, what's become, what's happening is it's just expanding. It's expanding and then concentrating down below. It's disappeared above, uh, but then expanding out into the West with uh, one notable place here uh, being a place where the kind of the streams are meeting, if, uh, so to speak. Uh, where that's uh, right adjacent to what's meant to be free territory, according to the people in, according to people in the Northeast, uh, but has actually been settled by people from Kentucky and Virginia, Virginia and Tennessee, and through the river, 
in other ways is actually part of the is actually more is actually more closely uh, associated with the South. Um, I think I have a slide out of order. Of course, the other thing that I like to emphasize that I like to emphasize is that, of course, this is something. Even though this is not well, this is not seem doesn't seem to be very very uh, carefully or very often thought of uh, at the time, you know, when the, during the time of the Missouri debates or now is of course that uh, Missouri was just like Louisiana in being part of the old French territory, uh, most recently Spanish, but part of the old French territory, uh, a place where slavery had been established since before the United States. So uh, it wasn't simply the Virginians and Tennesseans and Kentuckians who got the idea that uh, on the other side of the Mississippi was a place where slavery was was what was legal and where uh, they could force their enslaved workers to go. Uh, that was something that uh, had been long established that this had been a place where French slaveholders had actually moved across the river uh, earlier. So that was a sort of long established thing uh, and one of the first things that's brought up uh, when, the, when the amendment passes to ban slavery in Missouri to say no, and, and with the idea that no, slavery is not part of this future, is to basically say Missouri, one of the Missouri responses, one of the Southern responses is that, well, no, slavery is already part of the past. Uh, it's guaranteed was guaranteed uh, to by the by the treaties. It's guaranteed the these what they were trying to do. They said was take away property rights that kind of already were already of longest long long existence. So there was basically a fundamental a fundamental difference in terms of what uh, people thought. The West was about, and especially when it gets across the Mississippi, that seems to be the point where suddenly uh, there was not really any question about these other states. To go back to there was not doesn't not really any question about uh, one thing you see is after the War of 1812, there's all these different states that come in, uh, uh, Indiana and Illinois come in on the north side, Mississippi and Alabama on the south side, Louisiana at the beginning. Uh, and the War of 1812 really did a lot to clear away, the, to, to make it possible for this area to be much more heavily populated. Again, it's not something that we necessarily think of at the time, at the at, at, at now, but at the time, uh, it was quite realized that the that the that the War of 1812 was something uh, that was that was very much uh, in, involved in spreading in allowing slavery to spread. Uh, this is uh, this is a uh, from a from an anti-slavery book that came out just after the War of 1812. Shows a, a portraiture of domestic slavery uh, that shows the slave that shows uh, the Capitol burning. Uh, with some uh, slaves looking on, and I'm not sure if they're supposed to be applauding uh, or what the angels or liberty are doing at the top, but it's but, but it's uh, it's put at the front of the book uh, as as essentially this this is something that we would that that, that should be expected that, that with the idea that the burn that the capital is a is a symbol of 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 slavery and and all around the capital actually and this is something that continues through through the Civil War era is that this is a kind of center of the slave trade. It's one of the places where when, when these, these new Western lands are being opened up and large numbers of slaves are being forced, of enslaved people are being forced, are being forced to move, to being, are being transferred to the South and to the West. Uh, the Washington DC area is one of, the, one of the staging areas. And that's one of the places also where this vote against slavery in Missouri comes from. Is there's a newly elected Congress after the after the after the War of 1812, uh, uh, where it's dominated. The House especially is dominated by Northerners, and they're looking around. Uh, some of them seeing slavery for the first time, uh, and there's a lot of controversy actually about uh, the fact that the slave trade is so active. Uh, the slave, the international slave trade, had been abolished in 1808. Uh, but it's this the domestic slave trade was booming after the War of 1812, especially around the war around the around the Washington D.C. area. And this this book that this illustration is part of is kind of part of a sort of scandal that's going on about 
uh, the domestic slave trade's booming. There's an illegal slave trade uh, that's booming, people being kidnapped, uh, people being taken by sea where they're not supposed to be, people who are supposed to be about to be freed in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New York through the gradual emancipation laws who were being sold south and sold west to places like Missouri uh, just before they can be. Basically, the, the slave owners kind of cashing them out. Uh, so there's a whole uh, scandal involved in this that some of these northern congressmen are, are, are quite upset about. Here's another example from this, another example from this book uh, that's something that, that's kind of one of the backgrounds for the Missouri debate, uh, which is something we, we should have, we probably could have put in the, could have put in the, the exhibit, but I don't think we, I'm not sure we, we knew about this yet. Uh, this is a, a Washington DC area case where a woman was, a, a, an enslaved woman was about to be sold, was about to be uh, uh, sold uh, to Alabama, I believe it was. Uh, and jumped off a building, uh, jumped off a building uh, rather than being sent. Uh, so, so the whole idea of this, that the slave trade was booming, that this was, that this opening up of the West was about to cause this, uh, was about to cause this, this, uh, was about to cause this, this, this forced migration of people to the West is one of the things that caused some of the northern congressmen to say, "Look, no, 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 we're not doing this anymore. We're going to try to stop this." Uh, and it turned out that that was just a fundamental difference that Missourians had versus, uh, and the southerner the South had uh, versus uh, the way that people in the Northeast saw this, uh, saw what the future was going to be. And uh, that's why I don't know. I forget if I said this, but. This is kind of the point where North and South kind of see each other for the first time, right? And say, okay, that's what you are, uh, right? Uh, that, that's so, so, so you're not, slavery isn't an evil that's going away. Like, we, like, like the North tend to be assumed that the, uh, the, that the Declaration of Independence has said all men are being created equal and the slavery was gonna go away. And this is the point where they realize, oh wait, it's not going away. Uh, and in fact, there are people eagerly trying to expand it. Now there are lots of other permutations that debate, and of course there's a lot of that's, that's not as stark as that uh, in every case. But that's 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 uh, the sort of extremes of the debate, and that's the one that kind of carries forward. Everyone should read the Well Brown's book because it's uh, it's he's the he's he's uh, he, Claire didn't say this. He's like the Frederick Douglass of Missouri. So therefore, everyone should everyone should everyone should read him. Uh, you can take it down now, or I can take. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Jeff. And we'll turn it over to Steve, who has a little different lens looking back at things. And, Steve's uh, probably got a rebuttal to the whole thing. <laughs> okay. You have well, you have the floor, Steve. I, I'll, I'll, I guess I need to be quick about this, but uh, there are issues that are not in the exhibit that are not addressed. Um, and so I know I've been speaking on it, other colleagues of mine, um, on, on various issues that do need to be addressed. We just can't do it here. Um, one is, is, what's the definition of anti-slavery about 1820? Well, it's simply white man's egalitarianism. Um, slavery is not going to expand past the Mississippi River, but then neither will blacks. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And that is rampant throughout the northern speeches, especially among the anti-slavery forces. On the contrary, we don't really much talk about the diffusion theory. A lot of Southerners are saying, especially in the Southeast, slavery should be diffused, move it, expand it, because eventually it'll just leak on out of the country. And it's the only way we can get rid of it. Um, there are a few other things, um, like the Federalist conspiracy charge. Uh, keep in mind the Republican yeah, Party, the yeah. Jeffersonians are all powerful. Maybe a few that, pockets that's in, of Federalists. What? That's it. That's in the that's book. It. I just, you know. Is it? Okay. Um, but I'm just, these are things that are not really on there, um, whether or not there really was a lot of major uh, prominent uh, Jeffersonian Republicans, Jefferson, Madison, Jackson, uh, Monroe thought this is a revival of the Federalist Party. This is all, it has nothing to do with humanitarianism or philanthropy. You know, an interesting thing someone looks at are the various compromise efforts. There are a couple dozen uh, compromises offered. We always just think of the Thomas Amendment, 3630 line. Um, but there are some interesting ones that tell a little bit more about the story. One of those that aren't on there is a larger story, and it has to do with international diplomacy, what we historians call diplomatic nationalism in the wake of the War of 1812, larger territorial uh, expansion, because now that the war is over, we pour westward. Just thinking just the five years 
after from 18, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, five new states under the Union of the West. I'm not counting Maine, but uh, Indiana, Illinois, Mississippi, Alabama, and then Missouri, and it just explodes from there. Most Americans are no longer looking eastward. We're not going to cross the pond to the imbroglios of Britain versus France, which determined so much of our history to 1812, 1815. We're now looking westward. And that's what's going to dominate American history. And Missouri cannot be separated from that, a whole admission crisis, especially for Missourians. So um, and most people hear about the Missouri crisis. Uh, they conjure in their minds the great national struggle over slavery, which sets into motion this inevitable course of an irrepressible conflict, disunion, civil war, things of that nature. Um, those think of the bitter, emotional, divisive debates that seem to consume America at the time. Um, we can say a north and a south, the Ohio River being a geographic demarcation, now with the Missouri Compromise. There's a line drawn westward, north and free, but there's so much more to the Missouri crisis that people ignore and do not put into a larger picture. And it has to do with the massive American expansion. That's the most powerful story after 1815. And Missouri is directly the centerpiece of that. And it's just not from the, it's from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico and all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and I'm just gonna give you a few examples of this. Let's just take a little example. Circular letters of congressmen, one of the greatest outside of Jeff Pasley, historians from the <laughs> University of Noble Cunningham. My, uh, I, I, I replaced, he's, I, I was, I'm his, uh, he was my exact predecessor. He's a he, great historian. He put together where sir, congressmen will write letters, but there's not very many of them left. Uh, and it's very difficult to find, but he did a great job. And so if you look at the circular letters, these are congressmen writing back to their constituents. And um, so I went and looked at them for 1819, which is the first, uh, you know, January through March, the first great debates over Missouri, if we look back. So I went back and uh, I wanted to look at them. What did they say about Missouri? And if you really kind of count the words, there's less than 900 words mentioned about Missouri. And there's maybe 60 lines. Really, the only one that mentions it in a paragraph is John Scott, our territorial delegate. Of course, he's going to report back to Missouri on that. Um, but William Hendricks of Indiana, who voted eventually for the Talmadge Amendment and restriction, said no question of greater national importance presented itself for discussion at several days after the Talmadge Amendment. And then we have speeches by uh, proponents of the Talmadge Amendment over a course of two days. And then you see these rest of these letters. Um, and no mention is Missouri. None in these. But the number one issue mentioned is the US invasion of Florida in 1818 and the negotiations with Spain to acquire Florida and try to take as much territory westward as we can. There are over 7,000 words involved in that, over 500 lines addressing that. Uh, and in fact, some people, when they do mention Missouri, is just one line. Here's a quote, bills, which doubtless are, which are doubtless become laws, have passed for admitting the territories of Missouri and Alabama in the Union on a footing with an original states. Uh, even one that voted for the Talmadge Amendment says these sections of the Union will probably send forward their representatives to the next Congress, meaning Alabama and Missouri. That's it. That's amazing to put that in perspective. It's not until 1820 that circular letters really delve into the Missouri crisis. And but they still, the Florida issue is more important. The debates over Jackson's, Andrew Jackson's invasion and occupation of Florida consume Congress as much, if not more, than the Missouri debates in 1819. And congressman after congressman uh, from, from, from the Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, who mentioned in his memoirs, and here's just a quote, um, the excessive curiosity upon the subject of this negotiation with Spain is qualified only by the agitation of a new question in the House of Representatives on a bill for admitting the Missouri Territory in the Union as a state. And I'm not going to list. We're, we're doing a documentary, by the way, so I don't want to get too far. Missouri Manning is doing a documentary. It's going to be a multi-episode. It'll be out this spring, and it's on this issue of Florida, Texas, the Transcontinental Treaty, and the Pacific Northwest, the occupation of the Oregon Territory, the Yellowstone Expedition. Um, that, that uh, the Monroe administration um, wants to put the you know, American presence up to the, to the Northwest. Um, and of course, Indian removal. Indian removal begins officially under the Monroe administration. And Missouri is a centerpiece of that. And if you think about Missouri, what are we called? The gateway to the West, um, pouring across St. Louis into Cape Girardeau. All of the great Western trails from the Oregon Trail to the Santa Fe Trail begin here in this state. Um, and we'll throw in the Kansas City area, if you want to put it that way. Maybe that's a real gateway to the West for all those trails. 
Uh, and that is very important. And one of the things we do in this documentary is we look at, we have every article uh, in newspapers dealing with uh, the Missouri crisis. And if you go and look at that, nearly every one of these has something more about the acquisition of Florida, uh, the potential loss of Texas, what ha which happens in the treaty with, with Spain in 1819, which is eventually 1821 as it really goes into effect, um, and the Yellowstone expedition. Uh, we have, I, I, in the documentary we show, there are all these articles about uh, you know, this expedition setting out from St. Louis, heading up, where is it now? And then they'll go a little bit of an editorial on why can't we get into the Union? Um, Easterners need to shut up, we just need to get into the Union. And then another article either on the expedition or people populating out in, in the Oregon Territory. Um, I have, we have letters from John Scott, our first congressman, our first two U.S. Senator, David Barton, Thomas Hart Benton have multiple letters where they're saying the Florida issue is tied inextricably with the Missouri issue. And it has to do with the acquisition of territory. Um, and they, they will mention that much of Missouri's delay is because Congress is spending too much time arguing about what Jackson did in, in Florida. And so I'm not going to go too much into that because you can get a lot of that um, in this documentary. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but if anybody, I guess we have questions off of that. Um, but it, it's an, it's, there's a larger issue. Um, and I do have maps, but just imagine everything is going out of St. Louis, up the Missouri River, eventually Independence. We'll throw in the Pony Express. What the heck? It all emanates from this territory. We're looking westward. We don't want to see a bunch of potential Federalists and Easterners keeping us out of the Union. Um, and so sometimes slavery is a secondary issue. Yes, well, there's a lot of people who want to see can I, Steve, can I say that slavery, of course, is, isn't secondary to that westward stuff because the Missouri Compromise uh, lines. You're right. But what I'm saying is, is that when you really start reading a lot of the, it, it, slavery is expanding rapidly after the War of 1815. It opens it up. There's no doubt. Indian removal starts really in 1818, 1819 um, through 1821 as an official thing. So what I'm trying to say on this is, is you will see that uh, a lot of Missourians and people, um, even in the West, uh, a lot of those states bordering the Mississippi River are thinking we're just moving westward. And a lot of them are with the slavery issue, don't even want free blacks in this territory. So it goes even further uh, to another issue. Uh, beyond that. So this gateway to the West is an issue we can't overlook um, in this larger issue. And there's a lot there. And I hope you enjoy the documentary. It was going to be an hour long, but there was so much information. And there's a, myself and a, uh, several other scholars that, that are doing this, but uh, we might divide it into the Florida issue, um, the whole treaty with Spain, um, transcontinental treaty, which makes us a two coast nation. And then the Pacific Northwest, and we'll throw in the border with Canada from the Great Lakes westward, um, the Yellowstone Expedition, Indian removal gets its own. Because um, as we acquire territory um, and receive title, if you will, from Spain and um, Britain, um, we're also going to take it from the Native American. Steve, can you tell us uh, where the documentary will be aired or where people can watch it? Yeah, we'll have it on our website. We, have our, we, we are developing our own. Uh, it'll be on YouTube. Um, but uh, we are actually it's been filmed uh, it's in the editing process now but uh, we also have uh, now that we have a cinematographer on our staff and we've gone completely practically digital with a lot of videos um, we do have a number of grants a melon grant that we're doing now has to take a lot of filming um, and various other of our programs that are going digital if you will so um, hopefully right. we'll have it out by March April at the latest but it'll be before August wonderful um, well, we do have a number of questions, and I know we're going to go a little bit over time, so uh, we just want to let our audience know if you want to stick around, we're going to try to get through some of these questions as quickly as we can, and then uh, Michael Sweeney's going to hop on at the very end and give us a, a quick update on bicentennial events, and then we've got a prize giveaway. So if you can stay with us a little longer, uh, it's just so much to unpack on all of this, and we've got some wonderful scholars joining us to uh, help us do that. So, so thank you all. Um, but I'm going to go to the first question, which is, uh, do you consider Missouri's struggle for statehood 1804-1821 by Floyd Shoemaker a good source when researching the era? I guess one thing I would say a little bit uh, in contrast to what Steve had to say is the tradition of this, which Shoemaker is part of, and there's another book uh, called uh, by uh, 
what called the Missouri controversy by Glover Moore. Uh, the, the tendency has always been, they were both uh, what you call a uh, revisionist, which meant, uh, meant in the sort of early 20th century historians who actually tried to kind of downplay slavery as much as possible, uh, uh, especially as a moral issue. Uh, you know, it was uh, in the sort of the gone with the wind era, if you will. Uh, and so I, I think that a lot of times their, their facts are, they're, are quite, they're, you know, they have all the information that you could possibly have. Uh, they're not too good about finding out anything about, uh, about the actual enslaved people and, the, and what their take on it would be in there. And they're sort of, a, and I would say this of my, my uh, revered predecessor, Noble Cunningham as well, is that th that generation of historians, they're just not that interested. Uh, in uh, in in the in in have in um, in morally undermining any of it. Let's put it that way. Uh, and so, if there's any problem with it, it's more an interpretation interpretive problem that maybe doesn't always lead them to go as far as they could um, uh, with with some of the issues that we that we might be more interested in now. So Elliot uh, writes, wouldn't it be fair to maintain that Kansas first attempt to enter the Union, despite its failure? have as much significance as Missouri's eventual successful attempt? Well, I'd certainly say its attempt would have two operating governments, depending on which view you wanted to look at. The Compton Constitution debates um, uh, in Congress over that, leading to, to bleeding Kansas and things of that nature. Um, it's actual admission. Um, I don't think anybody could even tell you when it was actually admitted because it was just because of the Civil War. I would throw Texas in there, not only because the whole annexation issue is Texas leads to a major war as well, war with Mexico and the acquisition of massive more territory that will involve the slavery expansion issue again into the territories. Um, and that actually, did, I would say the war with Mexico has far more impact on leading to the civil war than the Missouri crisis does. Uh, not just oh, because it's- Oh, Steve, come on in. No, it does. The compromise of 18th the Slave Act, Powerful. Well, it's, all, it's all part right. of the same. It's all part of the same stream of things, isn't it? No, I, I would not put. Um, in fact, I do know that we're also doing a. We have a Mellon Foundation grant, and we've already done the first third of it. The next part will be on uh, before February 18th. You can get on a Q and A, um, and three scholars are discussing the polarization of America during the 1850s, especially starting with the end of the war with Mexico, sure. the compromise of 1850, especially and those massive issues. Kansas uh, being one of them, Jay Sexton uh, of the Kendra Institute will be doing a lot addressing Kansas. I'm not downplaying Kansas at all. Um, looking at the overall picture, um, tex the Texas issues is a powerful, the annexation of Texas, dealing with slavery uh, especially. Um, and it's hard to be looking back on history trying to discuss this because you could say, well, yeah, the compromise of 1850s, 10 years before the election of 1860. Well, that's, you're not, we're all looking at inevitability at this point. Um, well, but, uh, that's not what I meant, Steve. Uh, what I, what I, and, and obviously, Texas is usually important. Uh, what I would say to the Kansas person is that obviously, uh, Kansas coming in, you know, Missouri is involved in that, right? I mean, that's 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 uh, that's uh, the problem with Kansas is they open up Kansas, and then that's this competition. Uh, opens again, where the Missourians, uh, the Missourians invade and the New Englanders come and try to colonize. And that's the place where you get the, the, the actual two sides competing for territory. And that's out of that comes bleeding Kansas and the, the beating of Charles Sumner. And uh, like a lot of the, the, the snowball of events uh, comes, you know, the uh, starts with the Kansas Nebraska Act. I mean, obviously you can go always go back to find other places. But that's a that's that's a could 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 you, could you I'm gonna I'm gonna show I'm gonna show this one more thing I have here. This is something they they the the abolitionists put out during the during this is in the exhibit. Uh, what I think is interesting about this is the way that uh, of course obviously it's highly moralistic, highly unfair, but the way that Missouri sticks Missouri sticks out right. It's like this sort of sore thumb of slavery that's sticking out into this other zone, and of course. What happens, this is still Indian territory and what the Kansas, as I'm sure the questioner knows, is what happens in Kansas is they open up Kansas, uh, open up Indian territory, really part of Indian territory to uh, white settlement. And then this competition 
uh, Northern versus Southern slavery versus freedom, Missouri versus everyone else competition kind of breaks out uh, all over again. So that's a kind of direct, that's the, situ that's the situation that's set up by the end of the Missouri crisis, let's put it that way. That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathleen Bird asked, Missouri was one of the territories where the War of 1812 veterans who held land bounties warrants would uh, cash them out for land. To what extent did the movement of veterans from the East Coast seeking land impact the interest in joining the Union? Uh, it was it was part of it, but uh, not nearly just the massive westward migration uh, starting in 1815 covers just about every uh, portion uh, of the nation, most of them coming from um, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, uh, but also coming down, um, you know, through Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, everybody's pouring in. In fact, there was uh, several articles, uh, various newspapers were monitoring those coming across flat boats and ferries and things of that nature. And over a three month period, they were looking at anywhere from 10 to 12,000 Americans just pouring in um, to Missouri and eventually moving westward and causing a lot of difficulties with um, our relations with American Indian uh, and among American Indian groups because they're also being pushed westward. And yeah. you've got Quapaw and Kickapaw getting involved with the Osage, Cherokee and Osage during, at a war. Uh, at the very same time, between 1818, 1819, 1820, that we're, we're pushing for statehood. Uh, and there are some powerful uh, letters um, from our very first General Assembly, um, where they, um, at, uh, the Speaker of the House, President Pro Tem of the Senate, or Lieutenant Governor, uh, nearly unanimous, the whole legislature sent off a letter to the Secretary of War and said, extinguish all Indian titles. I don't care who's here. I don't care if it's a Shawnee in Delaware who came later. Um, the Osage still have some claims, all of it. And to follow it up, our first two U.S. Senators, Barton and Benton, sent a powerful letter, again, to the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, get them out, extinguish this. So there are larger stories um, that are this very powerful through the so old American history. Steve, is that in your book? Is slavery, that slavery is no longer technically an issue after 1865. What begins then is the continual brutal Indian wars. Uh, the Sioux Wars, uh, the 1860s, 1870s, the, the Southern Plains and Northern Plains and the Southwest, that powerful story continues of Indian removal, and it'll be the reservation system. Um, but that really does, you know, it happened prior to the Missouri Compromise, but that will really open it up. Slavery or no slavery, um, the white wow. man is coming. Slave, of course, sure. slavery is involved, of course, of course, the slavery is involved in that too, because, of course, uh, the Cherokee were, I mean, they're slaveholding versus non-slaveholding in parts of the Indian Wars as well. But no, that's certainly, that's absolutely right. The Indian removal is, is something that uh, is pushed very heavily by the Missouri, Missouri, uh, that Missouri delegation. John Scott's letter um, to uh, General Atkinson, who was really kind of the, the U.S. troops involved mm -hmm. with Long's expedition, the Ellison expedition, um, about, uh, for those who don't know, the Shawnee and the Delaware, um, relocated into Missouri when it was French territory, just escaping the Ohio Valley massward expansion prior to the War of 1812. Um, and as soon as the war is over, by 1818, they are getting to, the, before this territorial governor Clark saying, get us out of here. Um, whites are pouring across because they're mostly in the Perry County, Cape area, there are other places. They want to move westward. And there are numerous other tribes, uh, Kaskaskia, somewhat of the Illini, they're, they're pouring across this fleeing uh, white, you know, aggression and expansion. Um, and again, they got to face this, um, more of it, especially after the War of 1812. So you see some powerful letters and they're in the, the official, they're in the record book, you can go to see them in the territorial papers, um, where Scott's telling them, move them. Not only do we want the land, but we're giving them worse land and we're getting better land. And a lot of them have cultivated already. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's a, and this is, this is in 1818, 1819, 1820, uh, definitely in 1821, um, at the whole time that Congress is still debating, are you in the union or are you not? Um, when we have to fix that portion of our constitution with the Solemn Act, um, this is all going in tandem with various uh, treaties with uh, tribes that are moving into Missouri, moving out of Missouri, um, have some claim here. Uh, so, so it is, it's a powerful issue. Um, 
we're not even addressing, and I'm not, we don't want to get into it, but to keep in mind too, that 1819, we have the onset of America's first economic depression, the panic of 1819. And a lot of Americans just, that's all important to them, the economic morass that they may be involved in. Um, so a lot of other powerful images that are domestic. I was just going to the international scene, the diplomacy. And when you look at what Secretary of State Adams and Secretary of War Calhoun, who both have foreign policy issues dealing with Britain and, and Spain, a lot of their letters will inextricably intertwine uh, Florida, uh, uh, relinquishing claim to Texas, which most Missourians and Jacksonians refuse ever to countenance. Uh, but just keep in mind too that um, for those who don't know, we officially raised the stars and stripes in Florida uh, with U.S. occupation on July 10th, 1821. Okay, August 10th, 1821, exactly a month later is where technically we get a star on the stars and stripes. It's also the very same year that Moses Austin and Stephen Austin established a colony in Texas. And Stephen Austin coming from the Herculaneum area uh, becomes, recognizes the father of Texas. Um, so powerful issues here. Um, the, as I mentioned, the Yellowstone expedition, Missourians want to use this as an economic uh, move towards what markets are opening across the Pacific Ocean as much down the Mississippi River, out the Gulf and, and, and across to the Atlantic. But so there is there, there's a major issue here that we we tend to overlook and that will also set the course of American history, um, which will go beyond. Uh, the Civil War, definitely into the late, latter part of the 19th century. Okay, well, I'd like to be able to ask, uh, ask you all more questions from our audience, but we really have gone over time. Um, but I just want to let the audience know that if you would have further questions that we didn't get to you, uh, Steve and Jeff are both, um, you can find their contact information. Uh, Steve and Claire's contact information is on the Missouri Humanities website, which we'll show at the end of the program. Jeff also can be reached by the website for the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy at the University of Missouri. So um, thank you all for your questions. Um, but I do quickly want to bring on Michael Sweeney, who is here to tell us uh, just an update on what's going to be in this bicentennial year. Michael, it's here. It's finally. Break out the movie <laughs> maker. <laughs> Right. Um, hey, my thanks again to Steve and Jeff and Claire for, for their contribution today. It was really fascinating. I enjoyed hearing a bit of debate between uh, our two historians here. And I think emphasizing the importance of the exhibition that's moving across the state. It really does work that is not being done elsewhere and provides a really good accessible way to engage in the way that Missouri was at the center of the national story. Um, a few quick things because I don't want to take up too much time. I'm going to try to share the screen here real quick. One, uh, Missouri Bicentennial Commission, as you as some of you know, uh, sponsored a poster conference competition for third through 12th graders um, in, in 2020. They have selected their final four designs, which are right here on the screen. Um, you'll find them across multiple counties, Monroe, Jackson, Cape Girardeau, and Monotaw. Uh, received a total of a little over 200 uh, poster submissions from 45 different counties across the state. So we certainly appreciate um, the, the, the submissions that we received. Um, right now, uh, we have partnered with Hallmark Creative Marketing Studio that is going to take these four designs um, and give them a final look. Uh, there will probably be a few little alterations to, to these, but this, these are the basic designs that were, that were selected by the commission um, and its judging committees. Um, so you should be looking for that in the next probably month. These should be getting ready to go. We hope to have these freely available for people to use across the state uh, in 2021. Um, couple other quick things. Uh, two new um, digital uh, online social media programs have launched. Missouri Folk Arts Program, which is a, a member of the Bicentennial Alliance, is doing uh, 200 uh, moments um, dealing with Missouri folk life and sort of the role that Missouri folk life has played in the history, life, and culture of the state more broadly. Um, that is something you can follow on their Facebook page. Uh, the Harry S. Truman Library and Museum is also doing um, every Monday, doing um, a post about Truman's connection to a particular location in Missouri. Uh, again, another way to sort of engage with sort of the geographic and cultural diversity of the state um, through the life of, of our 33rd president. Um, finally, I want to mention that the My Missouri 2021 exhibition, a photo exhibition, is going to be in Cape Girardeau, at the Cape um, Girardeau Public Library from January 6th through the 25th. Uh, if you're in Southeast Missouri, I hope you take an opportunity to stop by and view the exhibition uh, and see the contributions from photographers across the state. Um, again, sort of showing off a year, a couple of years in the life of, of Missouri. 
Um, so those are a few little updates. I hope to uh, bring more and talk, certainly talk more and hope you'll continue to follow us on social media uh, as that is your best way to stay up to date with what is going on. Um, and check out uh, the, the uh, website so you can see all the poster contributions um, that came in over the last year. So thanks so much, Beth. Just wanted to thank everybody for joining us this hour and staying past this hour. Um, but we had such a robust, really interesting discussion. And as several of you have said, hey, bring it on, bring them back. So I think everybody really enjoyed Jeff, Steve, your, your, your discussion on everything. So thank you so much. I um, also want to thank Claire as well for being part of our guest this hour. Um, next month on Missouri 2021, we're going to feature all about Missouri art and the bicentennial, which will be on February 2nd at 11 a.m. And as soon as we have guests lined up for it this week, we're going to have registration open, hopefully by the first of next week, and you can sign up and register. Um, we know that there are many ways that the arts are able to give us a visual look into the state's 200 years and more. So you'll want to be sure to join us for that discussion. And a reminder that you will need to register for each program by going to either Missouri2021.org uh, to direct you to the online registration, or you can find it at shsmo.org along with all of the other interesting virtual programming offered by the State Historical Society of Missouri. Now, today's program is taped as all our series is, and it will be on our website probably sometime next week. So you can tell others who may wanna tune in if they missed our discussion today. Uh, in the meantime, we do look forward to being with you again on Tuesday, February 2nd for Missouri 2021 Presents. In the meantime, please stay safe, and we hope that you are in good health, looking forward to a promising vaccine this bicentennial year as we deal with a different crisis, a pandemic, and hopefully a conclusion to it. So if history tells us anything, we will get through it together. So take care. So long for now, and we will uh, show you the credits, which will also have the website addresses as well. So